So thank you and hi everyone uh, coming to our talk. We are super happy to be here uh, first time oh, okay. in uh, Madrid and actually the uh, first time it, at the Big Things conference. And we're also super happy to talk about one of our favorite, or my favorite topic, it's data ingestion. I hope you will enjoy that. But before starting our talk, uh, let me show you uh, the problems, uh, what we're trying to tackle here. Uh, let's imagine a, a, a data project when you have to do some kind of data analysis or when you have to do uh, training some kind of model. What is the more, uh, most fundamental thing what you need to start a project? Can you guess? So this is a data conference, so data. data, you are right. So if you have data, that's half success. So uh, really, if you have data, you are in a very good position. And after that, usually when you want to do some kind of analysis or modeling stuff, you have to transform your data in a shape to be able to use for your chart or, your, uh, or training uh, your model. And to do that, usually what you do, yeah, you write an ETI job, so this is my nice ETI job what I write. Uh, uh, usually I take some kind of sample data and try to prepare all of the edge cases based on the sample data to fit into my, uh, to being able to process with my ETI job. So, so far so good, everything was fine for my sample data set. So I now I try to do some kind of backfill because I need more data to have like some, to uh, being able to do some kind of meaningful analysis. What usually happens, you, try to do a backfill for one day. And as you can see here, you are very, very well prepared. Data is in a correct format, everything is fine. And when you try to run for a week, what can usually happen, that there is some kind of data which is not quite in the shape uh, what you actually expecting. So what you can do actually, but uh, like you have a data which is in an integer format and you expect as a string, it's not quite right, but you still can process. You're still fine. But what you usually happens when then you are running a, uh, for a longer time range, that you get the data like this one. So as you can see this, you can put, uh, you can process with your ETL job. Uh, so what you can do, you have some kind of deadline, uh, or maybe because of this kind of data, your data pipeline get clogged and you get uh, some kind of alert. Data engineering team wakes up uh, early in the morning, they have to fix it. So what usually people do, they just hack it in. And this is great for one time, but anytime you have to work with uh, this kind of data set or uh, data, you will always will suffer this kind of issue. That's why we try to uh, eliminate or minimize these kind of issues in our project. But first thing first, let's uh, ask you, uh, who is familiar with Prezi here? Okay, a bunch of people. So just a few words about us. So we have around 300 employees at Prezi. We have offices in Budapest, San Francisco, and Riga. Uh, we have more, like, uh, more than 100 million uh, registered users, and so far we are over 3.5 billion uh, Prezi views. But Prezi is not just the presentation software anymore. In our portfolio, we also have an in infographic tool called Infogram. And uh, last week we announced Prezi Video, which could try to combine uh, streaming a video with, uh, with your presentation. But this is a data conference, so let's move to our data. So in high level, we have around two petabytes of clickstream data uh, in, a, in, a, in a data lake. And we increase this number around one ter terabyte per day. And or how our data team looks like, basically we have a data scientist and an analytics team and uh, a data engineering team, and that's all. And we try to have some kind of make the data open. So in the company, basically, anybody can use an, uh, and anybody can access uh, our data platform. And as you can see, a bunch of people are using. So we have security, PMs, finance, developers, analysts. So a bunch of people, so basically the whole company. And now I would like to pass the clicker now here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Tamash. So, as he just said, everyone in the company uses data today, but uh, I think Bredzi in his history has always been keen on capturing data. So when I joined, I arrived at some point of the data history of Prezi. So at the beginning, it was a bit uh, more, let's say, self-made. Every developer who was developing a new feature was logging things that they believed were important. And it was in an unstructured format, it was not perfect. Uh, but then when I joined, we, which was about three years ago, we were in a state where we switched from unstructured to structured data because there was more need for data. And we believe that the point that we reached a, a more advanced level. Um, what is actually what I would actually will, uh, would like to uh, show you today is uh, how we got there. What was our starting point? How we progressed from uh, at some point where we believe that that system, that the way we collected data, was not uh, helping us in our needs anymore. So here were the main challenges we had to face at that point in time, which was about one and a half years ago. Our approach back then was to log everything that we had in the product. So every user interaction, we were logging it. Uh, we were also logging technical logs, so stuff we, that we were giving the user. And uh, everything was uh, logged in, uh, in Prezi and in the product. The thing was that, as you can imagine as an analyst, and from our point of view, it was very hard every day to find where some piece of information is. And uh, of course, with this approach of logging everything, not everything was relevant, and not everything was uh, uh, useful for you and, uh, and your analysis. And we had a, a log catalog, so a catalog of everything that we were, uh, uh, let's say, capturing in our product. And uh, this catalog, unfortunately, was not much in line with the reality, because it often happens that uh, either somebody in time pressure was uh, logging a new event and this was not registered in the log cat catalog and nobody knew about this new event or, for example, uh, some of the things that we had in there in our dictionary, they, they didn't even exist in real life because in the end some feature changed and nothing was there anymore. So you can imagine like the pain for us analyst was always to try to find the exact thing at the right time. And for example, a funny example was once we were uh, trying to define a new error message for an event. It was an attribute of an event, and uh, I was trying to understand which kind of error can I log to this event. So you can see, like we had like 27 error messages. We even had an error massage <laughs> among the list, this list. But yeah, so what, what should I log to this log? Like uh, should I log like a string or an integer to try to capture what the feature was trying to do? And uh, yeah, so this was not a very good position where we were on. And on top of this, not only we logged everything and everything was messy, like sometimes we had the necessity like to uh, see our events happening like in real time. Uh, for example, a new feature was released and we were, wanted to check real time what was happening to those users. And uh, at the time, we, everything we, ship, we were shipping to uh, like a central machine. So, not all the parts of the company had the ability to access this data uh, because they had to query via with bash on the central machine and not everyone could access them. And also we had a lot of lack of quality checks. So as Tamash mentioned, for example, sometimes uh, things changed in one of the events and one of the attributes were, I don't know, switching from uh, being an integer to a string and then uh, in that case, for example, when we were summing up things, all the strings were left out. And so our insights were not accurate. And of course, people were a bit uh, unhappy about the situation. And uh, in this case was actually a worse case where you know, your ETL pipeline doesn't break, but you can still do some analysis, but things were not perfect, actually far from perfect. And uh, yeah, but in other cases, for example, the ETL broke completely and we were stuck on first trying to fix this and then getting things right and do the analysis. So everything was around the fact that before delivering an insight as an analyst, we always had to do millions of checks on our data, find the data, see if the data was right, transform it. Basically, everything that happens is about cleaning data. It was happening back then, which is about what every analyst has to do from time to time, but we tried always to reduce this time. So. What this means for us, I remember one time 
we had uh, like a, a meeting where many people and many important stakeholders were invited, like for example, our head of product. And at that time, we had to explain why we couldn't deliver the insights or the things that we was asking for. So it was then when we decided that we needed a change. And we needed a change which, which was happening both from the bottom then to the top. From the bottom because we analyzed that all the interests, of course, to deliver something which was accurate and valuable for the whole company. But also from the top management, we wanted to have their support. And they were all on board with this because, of course, they couldn't benefit of the power of the data behind this 100 million users that we have. So this new project started. And the project was at the birth of data. So we wanted to reshape completely the processes and uh, how we capture data. Uh, you can imagine it's, it's a very, let's say, extensive project. It can be very painful as well because you, we had to go and ask each and every one of our uh, dev teams to try to rethink about how we log information and how we capture events in a different way. This means for them that they we basically had to scrap a lot of the things we've done in the past and produce a completely new way to code in into our code base. So, but luckily we had again support from the top on this. So this new project. Uh, took place under the name of Glassbox. By the name of it, we already wanted to have this clarity, this ability to look inside the box of our uh, data transformation and try to understand what's happening both on the transformation but also try to have clarity on the data and have a way that uh, everyone can look into the box, everyone from any business background in the company, or also product manager, everyone could go and get the data they need. So. These were the clear project goals that we listed back then. So on one hand, we wanted to reduce the time to insight. So it was getting to this unbearable position where to deliver something, we really needed to rethink about it twice or three times. And we wanted to improve quality and consistency of our logs. For example, we were in the position where uh, since uh, the product is in different platforms, so I can launch my Prezi like on my phone, on, uh, on a desktop app or on the browser, and everywhere we were uh, logging events with different names. So there was no consistency at all. So if we wanted, for example, to establish that a user clicked on next uh, in their presentation, then we had to have a unique name where we named, it, we named this event have, and have consist consistency across platforms. And then, of course, we, as I said, we wanted to empower more, part, more parts of the organization to look into the data, to, to self-serve into the data which was not possible at the time because all the analysts had that, let's say, coding had the capabilities to take the data, transform it, and look at it and provide insights. For this, we also introduced a few uh, new tool, a new tooling that we will speak about a bit later. So as a member of the analyst team and for the analysts team, we wanted to have achieve uh, a shift in our focus. For example, we wanted to avoid the situation where we logged a lot of garbage, and out of garbage can only come garbage out. So we wanted to avoid the situation where we log something wrong at the birth of it. And then we wanted to, of course, spend much less time on cleaning and uh, doing ETLs, modification and new ETLs, to try to fit all the edge cases we had. And of course, we were often in this situation where we didn't have trust in our own analysis, and we had to, every time, think twice or three times how we developed this insight and if it was correct, the right thing we were looking at. And this, we were in the hopes to have free more of our time to deliver more valuable things to the whole company. So more deep dive analysis, more modeling, hopefully, and something that creates more value for the whole business. And at, at this step, we introduced a new process called log management. So log management is another catalog, which different, of course, from the previous uh, log catalog. But this new catalog that we built plays now a central role on everything we do about capturing events at Prezi. So it lives under the principle of an enforced review process. Uh, this means that everyone in the company, every developers, are not able to implement any new events if they are not approved and, uh, and put into log management. 
So the catalog plays the role of uh, of ref uh, ref on this on this uh, on this process. So nobody can add new logs or implement them. Also, other process we introduce to uh, to to bring. Uh, transparency. For example, if I am a product person and I want to introduce a new feature, then I need to have clear in mind and I have to be able to visualize what the feature does. So what the user does to achieve something in the product. For example, we, we have a new uh, feature which is uh, uh, an image search. So the product manager responsible for this image search has to have a, a clear way to represent what the user does to achieve the goal of inserting a new image uh, that he searched on the web, on the tool. So for that, he has to build something which is a visual representation that we call click flows, and all the company can access them. And also, uh, we introduced something called job story loops, so we changed a bit of the approach of the analysis as well, so everyone has a series of steps that has to complete to achieve a, a success on uh, doing a certain feature. You can imagine this is important also when you do A-B test, when you do some improvement of the features. So it's a more user-based approach that it doesn't count how many times something happens, but whether the user is successful on doing something or not. So with this in mind, all the new instrumentation that we put in place was always with the goal of capturing the information that makes the user achieve the goal. Uh, also, another thing we introduce is a better naming convention of our events and uh, a different way to track user intent from what uh, we call technical events. So for example, if he, the editor of uh, our presentation can be open for many parts in the product, and so when the user opens it, we capture this intention with the event named Open Editor. When we actually serve the editor fully loaded, then we fire another event, which this time is a technical event, which is Loaded Editor. So you can see already how we name this differently, one in the past tense and one in the present tense. And this helps, for example, when you have to uh, make calculations about, for example, how much time is, uh, is uh, in between these two events. So you want to know the distribution by browser if you want to optimize for a certain browser. And another thing you can achieve with that is that if you want to build, I don't know, uh, an active time calculation on the, on the basic, based on user events, then you can, also, you can only use user events because this is actually the time that the user spends with the product. And you can exclude all the other types of technical events. And another thing that uh, we, we want, uh, wanted to achieve, again, was this consistency. So every event was having information and they were universal for every platform. And another challenge we had to face, as Tamas mentioned, is that now we became a multi-product company. And this means that we have to find a way that on one end we have to be consistent within product, but also we have to be able to scale this enforce review process across products. So we have to find solutions on the sense to have to have to achieve both goals. Yeah, and again, this was one of the things that again each event needs an approval and this we introduce a sort of a gamified approach. So we have a, like a group of admins where Everybody has to be very reverential with us <laughs> and ask for approval, but this is also to, more in general with the goal to encourage like the discussion about uh, how what's the best way to uh, capture an information or the information I need and not log everything again. So this is the process part. I pass it back to Tamas now. So yeah, uh, so I, I will go a bit more on the technical details because uh, that's nice that now analysts are happy, but we are data engineers and I don't want to wake up if we have some issue. And so far you could see that we have the log management, which is nice, but on its own, if you don't enforce what's in the log management, that, that doesn't uh, worse anything. So we were starting to thinking uh, about what to do and how we can enforce that. And we figured out uh, using this log management, we could get generate some kind of schemas what we can use uh, later on to generate uh, log lines and even to validating uh, these events or log lines. Uh, so we were thinking what kind of format we, we would like to support and uh, we did decided to go with the overall schema uh, definition. Why we went with the overall schema? Uh, because in the data world, it's uh, pretty popular, so all of the tooling can support. Uh, overall schema is pretty simple, so it's very easy to, to generate, very easy to work with that. And also, uh, schema compatibility is in the format, which means you can check uh, and it's well-defined what 
does it mean when there is a breaking change uh, between two schema? So what we did in the log management, we generated a, a schema, what we basically loading a Confluent Schema Registry. We were looking for some kind of schema registry which is standard and we can use for this use case. And this is an open source tool. So, uh, and basically it supports uh, validating the schema compatibility and uh, we can easily store that and it has a REST API so it was very easy to work with that. Uh, so far I was talking about one schema, but uh, in reality we we, we wanted to make sure uh, whatever platforms uh, your event comes in, we wanted to enforce the platform-specific attributes. So you can imagine that if you have a uh, using Prezi from mobile, then uh, in mobile or desktop, it makes sense to have a device ID which identifies your device. But if you are coming from the web, there are other properties like uh, user agent information, what we want to capture, and we want to enforce that uh, from, uh, uh, from, from the web to get this information uh, captured. So how we do that? We basically we come up with the idea to generating uh, platform-specific sch uh, strict schemas. So for every platform, we generate a, a different schema where we making sure all the platform-specific properties are enforced. And how this looks like. So as you can see in, on the screen, this is a, a where the platform type, this is an enum, so it means that if you, uh, and uh, at the platform time, which is desktop, that means if you want to send in like a event from the desktop, which code like mobile, we would reject that. And as you can see there, there is the device ID, which means in this schema, device ID is mandatory. Uh, otherwise, if this schema would come from uh, the web, this uh, property wouldn't be there actually. So that's nice, we have a platform specific uh, attributes, so we, we generate it for all of the platforms, but in the end we would like to store under one event uh, type and we don't want to have all of these sch schemas uh, everywhere. So we come up with the other concept like called as loose schema, which is the superset of all of the schemas and whatever is mandatory on the platform level uh, in the strict schema, it's, it will be optional uh, on the loose schema. First, as you can see, uh, what earlier was enum, now it's a string. Why we decided to come up with that? Because if you work with Avro, you, can, uh, you know that uh, if you add or remove the, uh, an enum value, that can break your compatibility level. So we want to make sure that we are enforcing that from the platform level, but we are not enforcing those enums in, uh, in the loose schema. And also, as you can see, device ID, it's there in the loose schema, but as a nullable value. So if, you, if uh, this event coming from a web, in the end, it will be a, a, uh, an event where the device ID is null. And we also said that for the platform static properties to have no compatibility. So you can break the schema anytime because we are generating all the strict and the loose schema. Because of that, we can make sure that we only uh, check the validity or the compatibility at the loose schema level. Because we generate all of these schemas, we can make sure if the loose schema is fully compatible, then the uh, platform specific will be because we are generating that. So you can assume. So we have now schemas in our schema registry, but uh, as you have heard uh, earlier, we could convince the management, but one, there is one harder thing to convince the management, is convince your engineers to use the proper events. So we try to make them as easy as possible. So what we do, did, we reached out to the different platform teams and we tried to find one champion who basically built an SDK for us. What does it mean? They built an SDK which basically went to the, uh, went to the Confluent uh, Schema Registry they get the scheme or the platform schema as basically they started to generate some kind of code. So like, let's say you want to capture the event uh, insert image. Uh, as a developer, you will have a method after the SDK generated the code where you will have an insert image event method and it will have only the parameters which needed that specific event. Because all the platform specific properties and all the other things what's needed for an event will be captured by the SDK. 
And uh, basically, we made uh, SDKs for all the platforms, so Mac, iOS, uh, Windows, Android, and web as well. So we have uh, the schema, uh, the code generated. We basically uh, capturing the events from the different devices, but we need to send it back to us and store it somehow. So how we do that? Basically, they are sending JSON messages to a logging endpoint where we en enrich the messages. Uh, these messages we add basically like server time or like user ID, but we don't really trust on the client. So those ones we need to add later on. And then, basically, we'll send these JSON messages into a log stash. Uh, so if you don't know what's log stash, basically it's a uh, very basic tool where you can uh, get data from various sources, and it can, you can do some kind of transformation if you want, and you can send out to various other uh, uh, destinations. Was this used for sending data into Elasticsearch? But it was pretty useful for us because it's very easy to work with that and very easy to extend. So basically, we added a so called an Avro codec uh, that feature to be able to validate with the strict and the loose schema the incoming messages. So we get a JSON message, we validate with the strict schema, and then we basically convert into Avro using the loose schema. And that will be the end format. And as you can see on the uh, top left, there is a uh, you uh, that server skip the logging endpoint because if you are coming, if a message comes from some kind of backend server, we are not enforcing to go through to our logging endpoint because they we can trust on them how they enrich the message. So after that, uh, we send these messages uh, to Akibana, our Elasticsearch, because we want to uh, have some kind of live stream uh, about. Uh, about the incoming events. Uh, this is a short-term storage. This is mostly for that if people are interested, what are the currently uh, uh, incoming logs, or they want to do some basic analysis and see what's happening, or, or they want, just want to check why the schema validation failed, uh, or what's happening, they can check it in Kibana. And we also send to our Kafka uh, these messages. If the validation uh, succeeds, we put in into a log stream, which is a log stream uh, with a topic name of the event type. If validation fails, we put in an error topic. So we want to make sure uh, our uh, event streams are validated. But uh, it's not that useful if you have the information in Kafka, you want to uh, somehow store these events. And how we do that? So we try to move the data into S3, and what we use uh, from moving to Kafka to S3, the messages we're using an open source project uh, which was open sourced by LinkedIn. It's called, it's called like Apache Goblin. And we just not blindly store it on S3. We also do some kind of transformation there. So, what we do? So, we have the event. First of all, uh, we flatten the event. So, if you have uh, like embedded properties like last, as you can see, that this is now body.event name, it will be. Uh, change to body underscore underscore uh, event name because there are uh, storages or like backends which can't really handle uh, these, these type of uh, formats. And then we remove the PI information. So for example, we are teaching IP address and we are doing GeoIP lookup and we are enriching the, uh, these messages with uh, GeoIP uh, information but removing the IP information. That's one example. And then, we wait for a while, and then we do a deduplication and compaction with this data. What does it mean? We are basically dropping, even if we get an event multiple times, we are dropping those events. And also, if you have worked uh, with Kafka and storing uh, data from Kafka to S3 or HDFS or whatever, usually how these tools are working, they are uh, putting down one file uh, per partition for a topic which is not very useful if you later on you want to query because the last file is better on S3 and in these storages. But what happens if, uh, so we are waiting for a couple of hours just to make sure all the events are coming in, but if we still see that some log uh, is late, like one day, then we put in a separate folder uh, as a late event, because in that case we had to decide case by case what to do with that. If, it, it, if it, uh, its data was important, that we might 
we might need to rerun all, uh, our whole data pipeline for that day again. Or maybe we just de decide to drop it. And then we store an S3 in a partition format, as you can see. And also we reg register into the high meta store to being able to query with Presto or whatever you want to use. So as you can see, we use the um, daily and the hourly partition. Now we get rid of that because it was too much hassle and too many files. So basically, we just decided, OK, let's go only uh, with the daily partitions. And when you have the data on S3, you have the Hive the Metastore. We provided toolings what we never had before. Uh, we are using Presto, and analysts can use, uh, or anybody can use, Zeppelin for ad hoc analysis. And we are using Indicative as a funneling tool. And I think Ivan will talk more about that. Yeah, thanks. So to go to the results part of our project, so after this all big uh, change, we were able now finally to have some changes also on the way we worked. So for sure, we reduced our time to insight. I wrote like by two, by two times because it's something like that we estimated. For example, based on our Jira cards before, we were always going over time on the planned amount of time we wanted to spend on some analysis. But then now we make it on time, even before sometimes. So this is something that we can see it from this point of view. And also, of course, we don't have to waste time on checking whether the data is correct and where is the data. And also, sorry about that. Uh, also, I can see that in the company we have like three times more user that are self-serving data. Because uh, in a company of 300, now I can count at least like 100 users serving them. Whereas before, all the power was centered on our team and, and a few other, let's say, people who had some coding skill to get some analysis out of the data. Um, and I wrote that we had almost no cleaning time. This is true. Of course, now there are other processes that we are going through, like, for example, changing our, some of our core data sets to use the new logs. And this is like an, another part of the transformation process that is still ongoing. As a member of the uh, data science and analytics team, what we achieved was, of course, that, as I said, this time spent on cleaning went down. And of course, we don't have interrupts now. For example, with pe more people, much more people able to self-serve data, they don't come to us and say, oh, can I please know what is the distribution of browsers on this particular event or in this, this particular process. They can find it out themselves. Because now, with the new structure that we have and with the new tools that we have in place, it's just a couple of clicks away for them to know this, the answer to their question. And then, of course, we managed to have a more a shift to a more strategic role where we could kick off like more data-driven projects, which are like initiative coming from us and not from the product side. And, of course, as I mentioned, for the whole company, the benefit was that uh, we have now Kibana, so we don't need to go to the bash and query the live logs. So everyone, for example, can go in there if a feature is released and how many users, for example, have done that feature and to check if the logs are correct. And now when we release the new uh, video product, for example, we were able to pull like almost real time what were the new videos created. And everybody in the company could consult this list. And uh, we still we, we used Zeppelin, Apache Zeppelin as our notebook. Still, there is needed some coding power, which we use for our analysis. We can plug uh, packages and everything in there. So it's a, it's a good tool for us. Also, sometimes we share it with stakeholders. They just need to run it through, and they can have a refreshed version of the data in there. Uh, and then we use Indicative, which is an, another third-party tool, which is uh, actually nowadays much, much used in the company. So it's a super easy way for product manager, for any other business stakeholder to put together a, a user flow kind of funnel. And uh, this is how, for example, it looks like one example that I, we put together. And, uh, and they can understand drop-offs in the job story loops that we were speaking about before. So if they want to optimize a certain feature, they can actually, for example, see their A-B test and, uh, as well in, uh, in Indicative and check which part performed the better. So yeah, so these were what we could achieve for the whole company and why this was beneficial. 
And uh, also, of course, we increase our data transparency because now with everything logged consist consistently across platform, there are way less questions coming up like, oh, is this the real event? Even from the, the non-data stakeholders, is this the real event I'm looking for? Or for example, we have uh, uh, descriptions as metadata in the events, so when they go into indicative, they have always a description paired to the event, so they always show what they're looking at. And of course, as I said, we decrease a lot of time on catching bugs. If something happens, we have input checks and output checks that we can go and uh, raise it to the relevant team. Uh, we usually don't allow something to happen because of log management. So if they have approval, then something most probably comes correctly in the right format. Um, and there are a couple of next steps which Tamash will talk about. Oh yeah, uh, so <laughs> we can't stop uh, the work on this project so because we, as you have heard, uh, we still uh, have things to do. Like uh, not the whole product uh, re-instrumented yet and we'd, we would like to uh, extend it and, and really uh, getting rid of the old uh, event collection uh, or data ingestion pipeline. So far we can't because, and it's, it's a pain for us now that uh, supporting both platform, but because everybody sees the benefit, we do hope soon we can move away from the old one and fully move to this new uh, data uh, platform, uh, data ingestion platform. And uh, we, mm, we not just want to support analytical event, but we would like to uh, use the same platform, so different other use cases, and even uh, like, uh, not like for example, even we can see example at the infra team who are collecting events from, uh, from actually the CI system, which is not connected to our product, but, but now people started to uh, use more and more for internal tools as well to analyzing uh, those products as well. And also of course, we have a Kafka, we have, we have very clean uh, data uh, events, so we would like to use more for like real-time triggers, so even uh, triggering events in the product, if you do something, we can, I don't know, uh, do something uh, based on the incoming event in real time. So we still see uh, a, a so this platform opened a, a bunch of new use cases for us. And this is where we are. And we are happy to hear any of the questions do you have. Thank you. Thanks. So any question? We were clear enough, I think. <laughs> so if there is no question, but if you still want to ask anything, we will be here for the party for sure. So maybe next to a beer. <laughs> so feel free to ask really anything. We are happy to help, answer, or whatever. Or feel free to challenge us as well. So thank you. Thanks.